Hi everyone, I'm Marie Blue Angel. Welcome to another part of Obscura. Today, I will be embarking on another route. Um, as I've already completed two out of the four routes available to us in chapter one. And by far, between Cirrus and Kier, I prefer Kier, which is great. Kier was so, I loved Kier's room. It was so good. I was honestly slightly disturbed from Cirrus's room, but that is okay. That is just a, a testimony, an attestment to the writing um, and the plot of the story, which is great. Thank you game developers and writers and everyone involved made that beautiful and complicated story. I will. I am very curious about how Cirrus's route will continue um, in the additional chapters, but I will leave that for, you know, the future. Again, today, um, I'm going to see if I can go find one of the other lump interests. So instead of choosing run to safety in the church or stay and see what happens, uh, which are options for um, Sears and Kier, respectively, um, I'm going to choose to leave because the crowd is kind of scary and I do not want to get swept up in all of this. So I am going to make Blue leave. Trouble is something I don't need. I turn away from the ruckus, begin walking, and turn off the main road to avoid any possible chaos. In retrospect, that is also a good option so that you don't accidentally get a not accidentally you yourself get unintentionally abducted the church will be there another day mm -hmm. the road i've turned onto is quieter but not by much the relatively wide main path through this area was packed with people but this side street is just as dense everything is packed tighter together here there's little distance between doors, lanterns, and laundry are strung from second and third floor lines. The buildings are the buildings all seem to lean in towards each other. In a safer place, I would call it cozy, but in the dark, and the noise and the press of strangers around me, the only word I have for it is claustrophobic. That's a fair assessment. Most doors are left ajar, with lamps in the window to indicate an open business. It's a, famili it's a familiar sight, to the point that my eyes now slide past closed doors and dark windows without a thought. But there is one larger building here, double doors open wide and pouring out light and music. Ooh. It's an obvious invitation, and I have nowhere to be. Ooh, I like the music here. I've really loved the music throughout this game. It is very fun. Okay. There's people milling around the entrance, and I have to squeeze past them. But then I am inside. Well. Whoever is running this event is rich. Their decorations and bright, clean lanterns all scream wealth. There's a table weighed down with food, some of it still hot and steamy from the kitchen. Don't mind if I do. There's no one stopping any random stranger from coming in and taking food, so I take one of the small plates and fill it with some choice snibbles. There may be no such thing as free lunch, but free snacks feel safe enough. The music comes from a large group, possibly 10 players in all. The musicians I've heard on street corners have been soloists or duets in one trio that was a highlight of that day. Um, I assume that this is where my choice lies in terms of seeing one of the two, one or the other of the remaining love interests. I want to explore the music. I love the music. I'm at a spot near a wall, where I am unlikely to be walked into and stand there. Watching the band. They're good, and it feels good to just stand and listen. I love live music, um, so I'm just doing what I would do if I were blue here. 
I can't relax completely with strangers surrounding me. I have to make sure no one tries to stick a hand under my cloak in search of my money or anything else. But it's a background concern. Most of my focus is on the music. A flautist is a playful solo, supported by the rest of the players, weaving a rich harmony. Another tune sees a singer duet with a guitarist. When I've gotten my fill of the music and my nibbles, and my feet start to ache to, ache to move again, I shift away from the wall. I walk deeper into the space. Through an open doorway is a large parlor set up with small round tables and an abundance of chairs. Okay, so maybe the exploring music was more just like a side path. That just brings you inevitably back to the main path, and that is okay, because that was fun. I wonder how many people are doing business here. I doubt barging into one of I doubt barging into most of these hushed conversations would endear me to these people, but there is a large crowd at the back of the room. They're even standing on a section of the room, a little higher up from the rest. That screams, notice me. The crowd bursts into loud, barking laugh, laughter. Whoever it is at the center of that conversation is probably quite entertaining. And then, on the other side of the room, is a man who immediately draws the eye. He He's dressed brightly in contrast to all the skulking shadows around him, myself included. Perhaps his posture is a little stiff, but I certainly was stiff as a new arrival to the marketplace. Unlike me, though, is all the evidence of wealth on him. The shining white clothes, the gold trim, the new shimmering mask. Any problem here can be solved with enough money. Maybe he's got solutions. And if he's new, I might be able to play my cards right. Oh, Blue, what a schemer you are. Understandably. Um, I need to make a decision then. <clears throat> I step a little deeper into the parlor to let someone else in. No need to block the doorway. Okay, um, I think I know who the second choice is, and that is the fancy looking stranger from way back when, when I was on Cirrus's roof. And I'm very intrigued um, by the fancy looking stranger. And I know if I am correct, then that eliminates the remaining love interest. Um, and, and it will be the last person who I think I'm... Yes, I think this will be the last. The other guy will be the last route that I do. Approach the wealthy stranger. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Looks so nervous. It takes me a moment to swallow my initial nervousness. But he's clearly more on edge than I am. That alone gives me the necessary push I need. Ugh. Oh. I love the red and the gold. Up close, I take notice of smaller details on him, the golden embroidery weaved intricately through his, throughout his coat, and the gorgeous engravings on the sheath of his dagger, the way his chestnut, chestnut curls delicately frame his face. He's quite beautiful. I waste no more time and slide into the seat next to him. Hey! Oh? <laughs> Sorry, that was... Oh. <clears throat> oh. I'm just gonna, for all these love interests, they will all sound the same. And that'll just be a slightly deeper pitch voice. He jumps right up. Brazel. F forgive me. I didn't notice you. Um. Uh. Who? Uh. Uh. Are you alright? Yeah, yes, I'm sorry. I only just arrived here the other day. Jackpot. He's an inexperienced as can be. Easy prey. His voice is lightly accented, tinted with warmth. I think I recognize it, but I can't quite place my finger on it. Then we're the same. I pause and hold out my hand. Blue. An unexpected blush rises to his cheeks as delicate fingers hold mine. 
Then he turns it so my face is facing down. And by the time I realize, his lips are gently brushing against my knuckles. He's already pulled back. His smile radiates kindness, but I'm left confused, having expected a handshake. Is this how people greet each other from where other uh, greet each other where he comes from? That's a lovely name. I'm truly delighted to meet you. <laughs> Fancy looking stranger looks so adorable. Look, he just looks so adorable. My name is Francesco. Well, Francesco, it's nice to meet you too. Does everyone give out kisses this freely where you're from? Oh no, did I perhaps offend you? That wasn't my intention. It is, is it that unusual to kiss someone's hand here? Incredibly sheltered. He might not know the ways of the underground at all. For all I know, he gave me his real name just then. It's uncommon, to say the least. <laughs> I feel already that this is the route where Blue is going to be the most schemy, and I'm living for it. But I'm also going to feel bad. Because Francesco seems very nice, but this is the underground. And not for people... Generally, people who are less, who are more naive and less uncouth are not the best, or not what I imagine would thrive, or people who would thrive well in the underground. It's uncommon, to say the least, but I'm not offended at all, just surprised. Oh, are you certain? Sure, you can relax around me. Okay. He perks right up, and I slowly realize that this boy generally, genuinely believes every word coming out of my mouth. The thought is almost frightening. I have to ask about his name. There's some unsavory characters down here who are all too willing to take advantage of people like him. Francesco. Francesco. I lower my voice. Yes. He tilts his head inquisitively. That's not your real name by any chance, is it? His face falls and forms into a small frown. You think I would lie to you? I have to admit that's a little hurtful. I sit there, baffled. The next second, suspicion settles deep in my gut. Nobody down here is actually that naive, right? Surely not. When you pass those gates, you pass them with the knowledge that you're going somewhere the, o the overworld would rather forget about. Okay, so putting aside that we're, Blue is trying to figure out how if Francisco is actually this naive or not, this is one of the first times that we're talking about the world outside of the underground and it's referred to as the overworld or the surface world um, as it has been before but this is the first time that it's referred to as the overworld which is really interesting but again if you have a goal do you try to attain um complete that goal while in the underground and then do you go back to the surface world i i still don't know i want answers that has to be it. He's deceiving me. Just as soon as I think it, he frantically searches through his pockets and pulls out a little card forged out of a fine whitish metal with his name carved right onto it. When his digit presses onto the smooth surface, multiple rows of engravings, uh, of engravings surface to reveal additional information that I'm too shocked to read properly. Francesco, sorry. This man is serious. Either that, or his plan is foolproof. How can I not trust him? There's nothing, su there's nothing to suggest he isn't a crook, except for my gut feeling. But this gut feeling is so strong. 
it's reckless to believe anyone down here in the underground, so I'll have to be cautious. But for now, I'll choose to open my mind. I turned off music a bit. Listen, you can't go around waving that card or giving out your name willy-nilly. That's just a, just asking for trouble down here. Again, he's taken off guard. Really? I, yes. Do you know where you are? A wonderful place. I've been told that if you want to experience everything that humanity has to offer, then this is where you must go. Well, that's one way of looking at it. That being said, we should find you a temporary name for while you're down here. A new secret name. Will you come up with one for me, Ruth? Hmm. What kind of nickname will you give me? Uh, something, something, I don't know, maybe silly. I mean, something normal, but <laughs> I don't know if we'd put them at a disadvantage to say something silly. But I want to do something silly. <laughs> but that's so mean. I feel like that's a little mean. Um, Goldie? Because you wear gold? Goldie. How about Goldie? Oh, sorry. What? That's. I hardly stifle a laugh. <laughs> Nobody will know who you really are with this name. Uh, I suppose so, but isn't that kind of embarrassing? I could make it worse. No, thank you. Then from now on, when there are other people within earshot, I'll call you Goldie. He nods, and when a bit of silence settles between us, I realize I've gotten sidetracked. How do I bring up the subject of Icar? I need to get him to loosen up first no point in anything, unless we've gotten to know each other a little first. Why are you down here in the first place, then? You mentioned experience all that humanity has to offer? Oh, yes, that is correct. I'm not sure if I'm imagining it or not, but a smile waves for an instant. My family is very strict, so you see, if they ever caught me loitering in the entrance to this place, they'd put me under house arrest for days. Or, at least, that's how it used to be. Huh. They sound overbearing to the extreme. They just care. I... I know I haven't painted them in the most flattering light, but they only want to protect me. I shouldn't be bad-mouthing them behind their backs. Not after everything they've done. Then, I'm sorry too. Have you left home? Uh, he stiffens and lowers his head awkwardly. Not good. He's clamming up. Just as I'm about to figure out how to salvage the conversation, he peeks back up. What about you, Blue? You're asking if I left home. Left home? He nods, slowly. Maybe he's looking for reassurance. I left a long time ago. I was out of my parents' hair very quickly. Didn't want to hang around much. That's the way I was raised, anyway. Wanted me to be someone independent and self-sufficient. Do you still have contact with them? Oh, I'm sorry. That's personal. You don't need to answer that. Another wave of silence passes. I sort of envy you. You were very brave for taking control of your life. Wow, such an optimist. There never was another option for me. You're so strong. 
You're so strong. It's so easy to make him happy. He's blushing right now. I should have just called him blushy. I, well, I did leave home. I've got duties on the surface, but I wanted to take some time off on my own. He fidgets, but words come easier to him now. Duties. I prod for more answers. Yes, my family hails from a long lineage of successful business owners. They're expecting me to handle one of the newly opened branches once I'm finished here. I don't have much in terms of wiggle room. I have to make them proud. His voice falters as I sense we've reached a difficult, difficult topic once more. But I've gotten enough information to satisfy me. His family could be of immense help to me if I play my cards right. Boisterous laughter and glasses coming together in a merry toast every other minute remind me of how cramped this place is starting to feel. Francesco seems to feel the same, and nearly jumps at the opportunity to stand up. How about some fresh air? How about some fresh air? I'd love nothing more. He hands the waitress a couple of coins and tells her to keep the change, which would have sounded arrogant if it were anybody else saying it. In his case, however, it doesn't come across like that at all. Okay, so he's generous? Or he, either that, or he's just un... Maybe he knows less about how much things cost, generally speaking, or he just pays whatever money he feels like it. Who knows? Francesco does seem very nice. I'm a little worried that he might not be as nice as he's, like, not unintentionally, but he might not be as nice as he seems. As we make our way through the crowds and finally make it back outside, I'm expecting relief in the form of a breeze, but in I'm instead met with the clammy, unnerving stillness of the cavern air, accompanied by an eerie chill. Though I'm grateful for the cold, it doesn't feel the same. Huh. I catch myself before I begin, longing for the surface weather, and turn around to see Francesco no longer trailing behind me. Panic leaves me with my heart in my throat, but not for long. Oh. After scanning my surroundings, I find him standing between two well-dressed men, tucked away in an alley between the parlor and the run-down apartment next door. Their attire definitely leans more... Their attire definitely, definitely leans more towards the practical, including weapons looking like small sabers sheathed away neatly at their hip. Their masks look exactly the same as Francesco's. On the contrary to him, though, their lips reveal no emotion. My first instinct is to interrupt with how seemingly out of the blue they ambushed him, but once I hear fragments of their discussion, I realize he's speaking to them quite naturally in a language I don't understand. They probably know each other. Uh, he's bowing to them. Are they superiors of some sort? I'm starting to feel restless. But by the time I've made up my mind to go introduce myself, the two others slink back into the shadows and disappear without a trace. When Francesco makes his way back to me, he seems conflicted. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, Blue. They needed to speak to me about something urgent. Make sure you tell me next time. Thought you had already gone and gotten yourself kidnapped. He shrinks under my gaze, ashamed. Surely you don't think I'm that reckless. Right. So, who were they? Well, they... Oh, well, they sort of keep an eye on me? Uh, hmm. You've got babysitters? No. No. <laughs> I keep trying to do Blue's voice. No. Bodyguards. They're like bodyguards. <sighs> bodyguards. What for? My family didn't feel comfortable sending me down here without anyone. His expression feels a lot more serious all of a sudden. They need me to be safe, so I will accept whatever I have to as long as I can stay here for a little while. 
I've said this before, but they sound like a handful. Francesco is an open book, usually, but this time I can't quite decipher him. They are my family, and family is important to me. It feels like any other question wouldn't be met with such, with much enthusiasm, so I stop. Around us, the crowd continues. The crowds continue pushing the streets, through the streets. Around us, the crowds continue pushing through the streets. The lanterns cast a warm glow over our faces, as our noses are tickled by the various food smells. One bump in the shoulder turns into another. We're in the way, and we've overstayed our welcome. Where do you want to go now? Did you have any other... Did you have any plans? Well, he falls silent for a little moment. I have a confession, Blue. Can we go to the bridge? Bridge? You don't know where it is? No, lead the way. At this point, I've still got no leads, and impatience starts to gnaw at my conscious, conscience. But I need to need my conscience to be quiet for a while. I don't know what confession Francisco is talking about, but it feels like he started to trust me more, even if just a little. Okay, okay. This time, my turn. It's my turn to trail behind him, allowing myself to be led through the tiny streets of the Market Palace. A part of me is still cautious. This could be a trap. But I still those thoughts, too. Ooh, pretty background. I don't think I've seen this one before. I love it. I love the red lanterns. The river comes into view, and we follow it until we reach the aforementioned bridge. Hmm. It's in a pretty good state, considering how long the marketplace has been active. How long has the marketplace been active? It's made entirely from crimson wood. Crimson wood, supported by painted steel beams. Paper lanterns hang haphazardly from the side railing, some dipping so low that they even touch the surface of the water. Despite the people passing over it once in a while, there's a serene quality to it. He turns to face me, smiling. Blue, do you remember when I mentioned that this place was where one should go to experience all that hum humanity has to offer? I do. Suspicion falls over me. Well... That is what I want. I want to experience everything. Huh? What exactly do you mean? I've lived under constant supervision most of my life. And now I finally have a chance to spread my wings. I want to be reckless for once. I want to feel alive. Do something just for my own sake. But still, I don't feel like I can do that alone. I think I can s I, I think I see where this is going. Yes. Blue, please. I'm sure you've got more experience than me. You seem like you seem like someone I can trust. Francisco, this is so cute. Sorry, this is <laughs> Why is this cute? He just wants to go on a little adventure and experience life. He's a baby. Absolutely. Let's go on an adventure. An adventure? You'll have to be more specific. Is there somewhere you want to go? Something you want to see? When I said everything, I meant it. I want to pull my first all-nighter. I want to drink and be irresponsible. I want to visit the most underground clubs. I want it all. There are so many sensations I've never felt before, and I'm making it my mission to finally live my life to the fullest. His, re his revelation leaves me slightly surprised. He'd almost sound like an overzealous teenager, if not for the subtle desperation in his tone. It might be it might be irresponsible, but I somewhat believe him. What escapes me is how he's able to trust me, a hooded figure among many others in this marketplace. Say I were to say I were to accept and join you for this escapade of yours. 
this escapade of yours, escapade of yours, however you say that, why would you choose me? It's not like I've done anything to earn your trust. Maybe I'll be the one who ends up kidnapping you. Oh. Then at least I'll still be experiencing something new. Oh my gosh, is Francesco just really optimistic? If you gotta screw loose, Goldie. That might be so. That might be so, but that's alright. I know you'll have my back. I have no words, nor the energy to tell him how gullible he's being. Fine. I'm not one of your babysitters. Let's go on an adventure, then. Blue. 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 <clears throat> blue. It sounds like my regular voice. Blue. Francisco almost hops in place with a delight. Smile so bright, I can't look away. Thank you. I can't wait. I've got an idea. He frantically points out at a street with clothing vendors nearby. The expensive kind. There's somewhere special I want to take us, but we'll need to look our best first. Do you have an evening outfit? Thinking back on it, I've bought nothing of excess. All of my belongings are purely practical. Nothing that would make me look my best, no. Then, allow me to give you one, as thanks for accompanying me on this journey. As the warm light of the lanterns contrasts with that of the glow worms, illuminating his face, I think for a second time that he's beautiful. That's very kind of you. The clothing vendors sell an astonishing variety of rare fabrics and beautiful handmade pieces. Silvery satins, purses with jewels stitched into the service, and nightgowns so long they reach the floor. With how differently everything is cut here compared to the surface, I think it's the perfect opportunity to reimagine my style. But I'm not sure what to choose yet. Do you have any intention of telling me where we're going? Oh, I thought it'd be fun to keep it as a surprise. But if you'd really like to know, I want to go to the Mosaic Club. The what? The Mosaic Club. It's one of the largest underground dance halls. No, I'm very well aware of what it is. I was a... I was... <laughs> Sorry, I didn't, really, I didn't whisper that. No, I'm well aware of what it is. I whispered back in a hush. But do you realize what kind of dancing happens there? It's far from classic ballroom waltzes. Well, of course not. This is a lot less organized. Francesco. No. People go there to get high on lights and gas. Uh, that sounds wonderful. Oh, please, I'm even more excited now. I guess this is what I signed up for. Yes, but first of all, let's find you an outfit. I won't allow you to refuse my gift. It's time for you to have some fun. He's almost pouting at this point. If only you knew. As we make our way through different little stalls, browsing the pieces at a slow pace, my, my mind wanders back to my predicament. Fractum Anima waits for nobody. Is it really such a good idea to be following him tonight? Should I not be looking for the Lunar Icker instead? Ugh. <sighs> It's a small sacrifice to get to know him better, to show that I am a trustworthy person. Even though what I'm doing is selfish. At least you know it, Blue. I swallow my guilt and keep my eyes peeled for the ichor amidst everything else. I can't give up. Finally, inside a quaint tailor's shop, Francesco holds up a piece of fabric. It's pure black silk, luxurious and smooth to the touch. Simple, but classy. I think a piece made with a piece made with this could look incredible on you. You think so? Black's my color? Yes. The idea of you wearing this is his cheeks flush scarlet. Hmm.
He wants to exp I'm not going to say I want to flirt with him. Why don't you finish your sentence? Oh. Oh, well. It's just that. Uh. I'll wait. He looks away. Clearly ashamed. Ooh. It fits with the atmosphere where we're going. It's powerful and elegant and... He fumbles. Keep going. I'm just... I want to see you wearing such a powerful outfit. Is that wrong? Under my mask, I smile, deeply satisfied. Cute. <laughs> I'm sorry, Francisco. I, okay, one, why did I choose that option? It's a fun option, first of all. Two, I want to flirt with Francisco. I want Blue to flirt with Francisco, so that's also the option. Three, Francisco says he wants to experience a bunch of stuff. Like, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure he's flirted with people before, but like, what about flirting in the underground? That's a new experience. So let's just go for this one then. Francesco hands the piece of silk over to the tailor, who assesses me with a short nod. I'll need to take your measurements first, dear. Go ahead. Would you like some privacy? I realize I will have to take off my cloak, and so I accept her offer, following her slow steps back to the, to the back of her little shop, where there is a discreet corner with a curtain draped across. You may remove your cloak in there and come out when you're ready. Her voice is gentle and unhurried. It's an almost comedic, comedically stark contrast to her mask, which portrays a set of vaguely unnerving hollow eyes that follow my every move. I shed my cloak without second thought and reveal myself to the tailor. I hold my arms up and allow the elderly woman to wrap the measuring tape around me in quick, practice motions. In the meantime, she gossips. I hear there has been an increase in festivities recently. There is a change in the air. The underground itself must be going through a metamorphosis. I see many newcomers every single day. I do. Seen anybody who caught your eye? A couple. It's hard to tell, since even masks get swapped out with frequency in this area. Oh, there was this one gentleman. What was his name? Absent. Well, I plain forgot, but he came by last month, quite the charmer, and left a great tip, too. Oh, he was just a delight. Oh, Absinthe must have been... Um... <sighs> From Kier's Root, we know that Absinthe is the name of one of the guys who buys the stuff that Kier and his group uh, steal. Um, but we never met him. I'm, I assume later on we will. Um, but yeah, that's really fun. I also attended to a famous baker called Leva. You know, the one who made those divine earthenberry brioches. Uh, is Leva... Is that Leva from before? Or is the, am I misremembering? From Kier's group? I don't remember. I don't have the heart to stop her rambling. Instead, I make a mental note of the names for later use, if needed. The measuring tape loosens around my waist as she takes a moment to note down the final number. Did you say you wanted a suit or a dress, dear? I want a dress. Very well. She nods and carefully writes down some details in her notebook. I hope you won't mind me taking some creative liberties with this. Far from it. I encourage it. Thank you, dear. <clears throat> we make our way back outside where Francesco is waiting wallet in hand how long will it take for the piece to be ready the excitement in his how long mm, how long will it take for the piece to be ready the excitement in his voice is obvious I can pay extra if you'll make it a priority madam hmm 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 and when will you be needing it Tomorrow. That is, that is very short notice. Creating a full body piece in that amount of time is beyond ambitious. Consider a week instead. No, please, I'll pay you double. He raises his voice. The sudden desperation confuses me. 
Surely he's not that impatient. Goldie, the Mosaic Club can wait, and so can I. Oh my gosh. Is there so okay, there has to be something more. Something more? Like, are you gonna die? Is your family business something to do with death, sir? I'll pay triple. Please, madam, there's not that much time. We? Oui. What? Perplexed, I tried to meet Francesco's gaze, but he's focused on the elderly woman. Hey. No answer. 275 rum if you want it in time for tomorrow. That is my best offer. Oh, thank you. We'll take it. I raise my voice to protest, seeing as that amount essentially equates to a monthly paycheck. Are you out of your mind? I can't accept that kind of gift. What's wrong with waiting? Finally, he turns to face me, lips set into a thin line, an expression completely unlike him. Please, Blue. I still don't understand. What does time have to do with any of this? Huh. He wouldn't know, would he? I take another look at the boy in front of me, with his earnest body language and perfectly perfectly manicured hands that curl around his purse. Well, I certainly don't know anymore. The tailor reaches out to accept payment from, from Sir Francesco so quickly, I think she's afraid of me changing his mind. Please come back tomorrow night. Thank you, madam. He turns back around to face me and smiles softly, almost nervously. Let's go, Blue. Without another word, we leave the street and make our way back to the bridge, air thick with tension. I know for a fact we both feel it, that weight on our chests, but we don't breach the silence. We begin following the stream downwards, eyes fixated on the water. It shimmers like a pool of ink in the darkness, opaque and midnight colored. Several theories form in my head. He's either got a secret of his own, or he is nothing more than a petulant child with no concept of patience. But that doesn't seem right. My stomach twists into knots. Maybe he's afflicted by fractum anima, too. Then, I stop those thoughts dead in their track. I'm being unreasonable. We arrive at a point where the river flows into a small opening on the side of the stone wall and can no longer progress. Around us, voices have hushed and glow-warm lights barely illuminate our faces. I don't waste any time and turn to face him. Francesco. He nearly jumps at the sound of his real name. What's got you all agitated? Well, I just got a little too excited about the event. I'm sorry, Blue. A little too excited? Right. Oh, I think it's bullshit, though. Nice try. Instead of trying to pull the wool over my eyes, you ought to admit there's something you're hiding from me. So you're lacking time. But why is that? I mean, are you only in the underground for not a long time? His semi -stun he semi-stunned into silence, lip quivering, his head droops. Again, the guilt rears his ugly head, but I try to brush it off. I brush it off, focusing entirely on the man in front of me. It's not as though you're hiding anything from me, either. I feel my pulse accelerating. Of course, he's right. But that doesn't stop me from curling my lips in distaste, thankfully hidden away behind the pri privacy of my mask. Is it really so wrong to hide some things? His voice raises in volume. Is it, Blue? Is it wrong to withhold information in the underground? I will apologize. I need to let it go. Pushing him won't get me anywhere. I cannot let my own stubbornness be my own my downfall. You're right. Saying those words is harder than I care to admit. We both have our reasons. I'm sorry. No, no, don't apologize, please. He comes a little closer, hand reaching out for my arm. His fingers barely brush against my sleeve as he retracts them just as quick. I just... You don't need to explain. As long as I can't offer an, expla an explanation of my own, then it's unfair of me to ask you. His smile's hesitant at first, but when I give him a nod, it breaks out full force. Thank you for understanding. I'm 
glad you're being honest with me, even though we do not know each other well. All good. Even though I'm back at square one, I feel slightly relieved. Somewhere deep inside, I really don't think he's lying. Eventually, Francesco glances over to the streets behind us, still alive with constantly changing crowds and vendors and music, and I, reala and I realize I've forgotten about how much time has passed. Though I'm not tired yet, my biological clock tells me it's time to get rest. Will I see you tomorrow then, Blue? Of course. I subconsciously check my pockets, relieved to find the keys to the leaping bear still lying next to my coin purse. With that, and a quick farewell, we part ways. Now that I'm finally alone, the exhaustion comes back full force, and with that, I stop dead in my tracks as a dizzy spell washes over me. My hands grab at the air for the nearest object of support, in this case, the railing next to the water. Shit. I let the wave of nausea, of nausea pass with a couple of deep breaths. Then the sensations leave as though they'd never happened in the first place. Ugh. I shouldn't stay out here much longer. Not in this kind of state. Is it the fractum anima? The way back to the leaping bear is straightforward, thankfully. The moment my bedroom door closes behind me, I collapse onto the wooden floor. I make quick work of my mask and toss it aside, relieved to breathe normally again. At least see sleep comes quickly now. Not even the worries of how tomorrow will go keep me awake. Ooh, okay. And that's where I'm going to end it today, also. I'm very curious about Francesco and his route in chapter one here, but I don't know exactly how to feel. It's quite fun. I like the route so far. But I actually, I'm trying to come up with my own theories of what is Francisco's situation. There has to be more than just he's here visiting for the sake of visiting and experience the, experiencing a bunch of new things. Because there's also this timepiece. Um, but I guess I won't know until a little later. If I'm sure. I'll find out somewhat later. I don't know if, if it'll be in this chapter or in the next. But yes. Um, let me know how, how you think of it um, so far. This route and everything. Um, I really, yeah, I really like it. I've enjoyed this route and the last route in particular. Um, so yeah, I will come back with another episode soon and I will see you next time. Bye.